at the risk of tiring uh, the listener, I'm going to uh, just quickly try to recap the uh, end uh, or summarize my kind of ending suggestions to Jordan Hall. So the, when I was going on about morally neutral problems, uh, perhaps another way to kind of condense what I mean is logistical problems, that there are, let's say, inherent logistical problems in having any kind... Paradoxically, you can't have decentralized um, society or decentralized economies without some kind of pervasive buy-in to some form of shared platform or system for coordinating. Um, and then as soon as you do that, you have to have uh, the added trouble of having some kind of institutional um, function that allows you to adapt and revise the structure of that uh, platform. And, you know, uh, then you have sort of added political problems, let's just say that, um, uh, you know, you can never preserve perfect freedom, but you need some way to have access for the individual to interface with that structure and be able to kind of revise it uh, f from the individual scale. And, you know, I, I was trying to insinuate that the, the best way that that has ever been put down in, in the best legal system that we have generated in our history has been something like the Roman Dutch substantive law, which really needs to be looked into because... You know, without that level of, let's say, um, imagination or, or rational, uh, you know, of, of thinking what systems are capable, of, the complexity that systems are, are um, uh, the, of, of the complexity of structures that are able to cater to um, holding the individual in, in a certain esteem and honor. Um, I mean... The, the biggest problem essentially that people have that will be an impediment to moving into this sort of uh, situation is simply that, that uh, right now society effectively um, is the way it is because it has to protect members of society from other members of society that are simply not capable of sustaining their contract, as it were. They're, they're, they're not capable of, um, you know, the primacy of contract and and... Uh, which is in some level uh, in terms of, of w w when, when you uh, monitor what people um, are like uh, in terms of uh, their ethical consistency and such um, and their ability to kind of uh, be self-determined and responsible and uh, pursue their uh, objectives within that framework, uh, you know, it is severely dampened because of what I would generally call uh, uh, the insanity of uh, uh, inherent in personality styles, which most of the population are effectively uh, driven by uh, in, and trapped within the kind of reactive circuitry thereof. Um, so effectively, people have these tremendous blind spots, which they use to create the drama and the havoc which they need to basically sustain their own internal resistance, which you know is usually some kind of imprint from some sort of early uh, trauma, which which is the seed of their ego or of of what I would call false ego. But, you know, a personality style um, is, uh, you know, a lot of it is unconscious uh, and, and you develop it early in life and then it kind of becomes unconscious from the later developments which try to create some kind of stability but which have so many pernicious mechanics attached to them that have to find a way to essentially uh, seep into... You know, there has to be a, a space made f for that kind of, of self-sabotage, but also um, the collateral damage of that self-sabotage. Uh, you know, you need systems that aren't fragile enough 
that they can't, that they just expect everyone to be enlightened. You know, uh, you have to have, uh, you know, and, 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 and so the issue of contract itself, uh, you know, becomes both the fighting grounds for keeping the libertarian freedom possible and alive. You know, it's, it's almost like a call to the attainment of the integrity that is inherent within human beings. Um, and then, you know, when you've got these kind of uh, uh, sociological deconstructions of defining problems just in terms of group uh, 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 analyses or whatever, but then you don't actually model like how you organize a group to sort of um, circumvent these defects and, and these problems um, is almost to wish away the problem and not to deal with it and handle it effectively and directly. Um, I, mean, I, I can give some vague prescriptions which I believe are more um, hands-on. Uh, I, I was going to uh, also just, I was going to um, make an example of one of uh, the first claims that I made, which is that uh, logistical problems inherent within a, a decentralized uh, economy. Um, you already see examples of these kinds of logistical problems within capitalism and not in the uh, let's say the the unsavory element of capitalism, but in in fact the decentralized aspect of capitalism, that that almost has to be circumvented. It has to be saved from itself. Because, for example, when people invest in the same industry, and let's say an industry is overcapitalized, um, everyone loses out effectively. And in fact, it has a systemic losing out effect. Is because let's say you everyone sees that one industry is lagging behind, there's no innovation within it, and so people with spare capital say, okay, well, that's where we should put our attention. And, you know, obviously, you make money by solving other people's problems and by making life better and out-competing things. But if multiple people have the same idea at the same time, and they're all in the planning phase at the same time, and then they sort of come out with their actual, you know, when there's no coordination of capital investment, and it, it doesn't have to be coordination on the, almost the, uh, uh, I mean, on some technical sense, the kind of coordination that I'm talking about would very technically, I think, almost be illegal in, 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 in you know, in that it's almost like a cartel uh, coordinating between itself. But, you know, it doesn't have to be coordinated in terms of the nitty gritty. It can just simply be coordinated is let's just all put our cards on the table in terms of how much money we're, we're putting towards different industries, just so that we can see what the spread is, just so that we can see, uh, uh, you know, where, I mean, obviously just pure money is not quantifiable depending on, you know, what the actual researchers might come up with and what the actual technology is. You know, you get disruptive influences, obviously, but there, at least you can remove a known uh, problem, which is that overcapitalization of an industry, uh, which makes everyone lose out and makes capital less productive, and if effectively that capital could have been put elsewhere, and you would have had a more global, uh, uh, let's say, um, increase in something, or at least uh, overall you would have a greater uh, recourse, let's say humanity as a whole would have a greater recourse to developing um, intellectual property that increases uh, uh, um, wealth or, or something like that, um, or that creates the potential for increased wealth. Um, see, the utilization side is, is another uh, sort of problem, but um, anyway, so the... Uh, that it gets horribly dry to get into the kind of the, the very stupid details, but um, so I mean, the problem is is that at some point you have logistical problems that have to be translated into some kind of almost political structure um, that that has let's say some potential of structuring which is also another way of commanding or ordering um, how things are done to kind of maximize transparency so that it's so that people can at least um, 
read signals that aren't going to be uh, uh, inherently faulty, let's just say, or at least so that there are some signals to at least have some kind of bearing, you know, so, so that it's not just this absolute chaotic decentralization. And uh, so another way of illustrating the problems of decentralization, for instance, is simply that not only is there a problem that you need to, let's say, be somewhat on the same page or, or be on some same page that has some shared structure uh, so that people have some sort of bearing, but that when people are on different pages, that also brings about its own um, you know uh, you know it's basically you you get the same problems I mean just because you call something decentralized doesn't mean that all the problems are wished away and in fact uh, the as I said before paradoxically you can't have a decentralized um, economy with without some kind of pervasive buy-in into some form of shared system or platform of coordinating. And as soon as you have something that does that, then it has to somewhat be open to revision. Um, and that has to be managed in a way that can respect the individual. Now, you know, that that's a mouthful, you know, and... In order to even get to that point, you have to, let's say, agree on a huge bank of almost arbitrary um, features that the system is going to contain, which it's not clear that it should be one way or the other way. In fact, it doesn't matter because the arbitrary features, although vitally important for contextualizing the aftermath and, let's say, the, the, the morally charged uh, integration that needs to occur in the aftermath, that you have to have let's say, a, a decent culture of, of at least a sophisticated enough uh, a legal framework or, or republic that, that's capable of, of um, having an individual interface with, with the machinations of the entire system. Um, so you, you, you want to have that, but that can only happen after there is a... a at least some, what do you call it, a uh, uh, reservoir of, of shared um, uh, I mean, you could probably use uh, language itself as an analogy, is, is that imagine decentralizing language. It, it wouldn't work. You know, language is probably the best kind of analogy for, for how you have to keep this sort of thing together. And in fact, language is perhaps uh, uh, at least metaphorically, um, you know, how languages d uh, uh, decentralize into dialects and become more and more alien with each other or to each other and more and more distant uh, from each other. Um, I, I believe that a, a lot of that is almost almost the tendency of something that you can almost take from from a parable it, taking almost the tower of babel as as a, reading that as a parable you can understand that the tendency to fragment like that is effectively so that um You know, that was a bad example to bring up, not because I couldn't square that circle, but it would take way too long <laughs> to, 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 to bring those kinds of uh, 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 spiritual and metaphysical issues um, uh, and, and, and make them relevant. Um, and it, a lot of that would be far too tangential as well. But um, uh, let me just think, what was the other... Yeah, so, I mean, obviously you can't, um, 
sort of avoid the problem by kind of disguising it in uh, aspirational sociological um, narratives over escaping from um, problems uh, that people have to have some kind of collective ownership and responsibility um, or personal responsibility to the collective. Let's say that the greater social edifice in society, which could be governed by prestige, and let's say the prestige of sense-making could be completely decentralized, but the economic aspect um, is something that does, and, and the political aspect even, which would also indirectly interface with, let's say, the completely libertarian and unbridled sense-making um, prestige market, uh, to call it a market, or at least marketplace of ideas or something, um, or suggestions and invitations to entertain and, and um, contemplate um, and to talk about uh, and such. Uh, but I mean, you know, the question remains, how will you, um, I mean, yeah, so I, on some technical level, you could say, yeah, well, the problem is, is that we need to remove dominance from our life, but we have to accept that we will always be dominated by something. And I, I think this is the blind spot that um, Jordan Hall has is that he very abstractly thinks that dominance is something that can be almost completely removed. And so he doesn't have a peacemaking apparatus with the levels of dominance, which in fact cannot be removed. In, in, in some sense, we will always be dominated by what I keep on referring to as morally neutral issues, logistical um conundrums, you know, that, that, that there will be arbitrary features which you will have to find a way to compromise and agree on. And it's almost, that is where freedom itself and liberty itself has its most, let's say, open door put in front of it, but um, it also is the, the, uh, the greatest trap because as soon as you do something just based on whim and fiat let's just say and that is going to somewhat characterize your group although it's not a moral even if the group knows that that they are engaging in something which is almost fundamentally arbitrary but that you have to put one step forward you know in some way you have to help the flesh in in this regard um you the spirit has to do something for the flesh uh you know, it, it has to be always willing to to uh, sacrifice the flesh, but it still is is outlining the kingdom within uh, uh, that uh, form, and it can't get away from that. Um, it is only transformed by, let's say, the emergent, uh, full encompassed and integrated uh, uh, appreciation of um, these issues, which uh, you know do produce various uh, uh, gradations of, of, of types of, of problems, you know, and, and being able to clearly categorize these things and go into them, um, you know, it's something that science is completely incapable of doing. The scientific perspective is in completely incapable of doing. I would even, uh, uh, you know, the, the, there's something, uh, Sam Vaknin has made some very intelligent comments about these sorts of things. I would just say that, you know, he, 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 appropriately criticizes um, the scientific method in terms of at least psychology, um, but his, obviously, their uh, that, that idea of science is itself, uh, I mean, you know, that is what exists and what is generally understood to be science, but obviously the, the, you could have a metaphysical science which is not so... Um, uh, limited, let, let's just say. And in fact, we have to understand that the psychological reality is preeminent and, and, and in fact, um, 
is the thing that that contextualizes the rest of reality um and you know there isn't some kind of scientific frame that dominates um the realm of consciousness uh you have to be grounded in a kind of um i mean you know science at some point will have to surrender almost to someone who actually thought through a lot of these problems in the 50s l ron hubbard uh which uh you know if, if even the word scientology science is in a sense eternally screwed because somebody else got there first and invented the term scientology and now it's you know like what can it do because it it can't uh, claim that title and, and try to uh, get into that field. It's essentially, uh, uh, the term at least, has already been uh, uh, copyrighted. So science is in that way very screwed <laughs> that it can't, uh, you know, uh, I mean, there are lots of, I, I've got recordings that go on and on about the inherent limitations of scientific thinking and the scientific method and the philosophical stumbling block, which... Uh, you know, how it presumes things which we know to be false, and it cannot break those presumptions because it is just locked in uh, uh, to its very uh, uh, fragile, um, uh, what is now a kind of philosophical sophistry where it doesn't even, you know, it kind of closes its eyes and I think it calls itself uh, uh, like a family uh, philosophy or, so, or something like that, 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 you know, all these different sciences are kind of have this, uh, sui generis, uh, uh, interrelation and, and, you know, it, it's, it's a kind of Newtonian puzzle, uh, that's being filled in eternally. And, you know, when the last piece of the puzzle is found, uh, and never mind that you can know that that model already is just completely faulty has in fact already been disproven. By quantum phenomena that that is not how reality is structured that the the presumption of temporal determinism that is built into the scientific method uh, we know to to be faulty we, we know in fact does not conform to reality but still they do it and so science is essentially capable of making no new ground in terms of the deepest level like it might find you know new technical things or, or whatever but uh since the 1920s effectively there has been uh no progress i mean there might be some kind of technical progress in terms of uh um making new machines but i mean if anything i mean th there's very little that exists today that couldn't have been made by lord cavendish essentially the science that lord cavendish the only difference between lord cavendish and today is effectively that uh, we had two world wars in which we had public money to develop um, technical apparatus. But the actual science that we use and that we put to use, I mean, is, is uh, you know, it, it's not like, you know, people have this very uh, uh, pseudo-religious view of the kind of the god of science or something uh and as an intellectual enterprise it's it's not even worth talking about uh and they even speciously use that to their defense oh well you know you don't understand what science is or something like that and essentially they've got this kind of this forked tongue where they you know uh what did they used to call it the um there was a kind of there was a view of reality which uh, which they said that the hard sciences basically had this kind of philosoph this distilled philosophical thing and only five people actually understood it. I was one of those people at a time because I remember talking to the people who were one of the people that were on that list and they and I could even recite you know all all their uh, dicta essentially of how they construed their their belief system and then they said, oh, you see, you do get it. And then in, in uh, three paragraphs later, I could literally de debunk them in their own conceptual uh, 
uh, conceit, you know, it, it, it's uh, uh, because there are inherent problems. And, and the idea is that, yeah, no, no, we know that there are some inherent problems, but that is where progress will be made, essentially, that uh, we just need to find out the minutiae uh, of, of how, uh, you know, that, that will have to be modeled by and we can predict exactly in which field that will provide the model that integrates those features, and it's uh, th that is not true. No, um, it, it's uh, uh, in fact these these bubbles of science uh, that exist, these different magisteria, are in fact incredibly. Um, they are they are almost by definition junk. You only can make a comprehensive model out of something that has essentially already been disproven uh, on some almost fundamental reality, but that. It's it's a full toy playset. Uh, it's funny. I've I've seen Richard Dawkins make this insinuation after I I wrote paragraphs uh, in essay form on this particular uh, kind of topic. Um, I think quite quite clearly. Uh, and I I I have through let's say forum um, exchanges been able. I mean, when I'm actually in a dialogue, it's much easier to to underline exactly the bullshit that is being peddled um anyway uh this is a horrible tangent um so is there anything that i've left out that i was thinking about saying uh Yeah, so, I mean, another way of characterizing, let's say, the issue with Jordan Hall um, is this kind of idealism and abstraction, uh, which is too representative uh, uh, in his uh, uh, general ideas of, of having a solution. Um, but that I, I would say what, what you should, in fact, do is try to find a way to compromise with what you dislike. Because if you can find a way to compromise with what you dislike, instead of trying to almost obviate it in some very abstract and idealist way, what you end up doing, in fact, is creating some kind of model that, in fact, gets pervasively infused by that uh, uh, problematic um, uh, uh, theme. Or you know, and and I, I gave one example of this in terms of how. Uh, you know the idea that you tax the rich, you you tax, you you give extra taxes and extra taxes to the very very rich people, um, and you know you're really getting those bastards then, aren't you? You know uh, you're really showing them that they shouldn't be rich, and in fact what you're doing is you're creating this unholy alliance between, let's say, the economic functioning of the state and the structure of the state as being wholly dependent on collecting taxes and therefore also structurally being complicit with setting up a runaway inequality because if you get a higher rate of tax from the super rich then in fact it's more stable structurally to generate more super rich people um, because you can co collect more from them and in fact you have to facilitate them somewhat structurally because when you actually do your books, more and more of your revenue of your tax collection comes from the super rich. And so now you've almost got a structural complicity of having to sustain uh, that. Whereas if you had, let's say, a flat tax, then the incentive for government would actually be in the right place, uh, let's just say. Uh, uh, and you would, in fact, then very quickly government would be self-limited in that if it created policy uh, that that favored big bigger institutions uh, that were owned by fewer people um, and it didn't let's say keep the real economy healthy and vibrant uh, uh, affirmative action is a huge example in in how you sabotage your own economy effectively um, and also setting up lots of of ways of of, of corrupt uh, political uh, cronyism and, and such uh, when you've got this kind of uh, these benefits that must go to tokens um, and, and they must receive that benefit based on their token and symbolic uh, uh, value of justice that they receive from getting it. As soon as you've created that kind of policy, you've created essentially a runaway uh, 
artificial and it, you know it, it's kind of like a self-propelling uh, 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 spiral of greater and greater incompetence because you don't actually have to develop authentic solutions to the problem. You've got this artificial thing which essentially comes at the cost of the enemy of the scapegoat. You know, so you you have to breed this resentment and the structural uh, 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 theory of uh, um, of identity consciousness effectively, and it it basically just. Uh, uh, you know, it just gets larger and larger and la larger um, until it takes over everything, and it's exact. It operates exactly like a cancer does. It really does. Uh, uh, th this is uh, on on a on a societal level. This the same. This is the same problem as what's happening psychologically um, within at least those people who belong to, to the, the beta quadra um, of personality style, uh, and I'm just using the socionics uh, description of, of beta quadra, uh, which I, I, don't ex I don't endorse those uh, personality matrices, but they are good enough approximations. Yeah, I guess that's probably enough of a rant. Um, just after listening to my own recording, I think I should just put in a very important addendum that when I was going off about science, I didn't quite tie that in and make it properly relevant. But uh, what I meant by the conglomerate of philosophical or that, that level or species of, of kind of... Uh, uh, type of thinking is is i'm associating that uh that form of of uh, uh reductive analysis in very um you know in in a kind of uh in a system of one thing that that is uh you know uh, almost just decoded down into a, a monetary um Sorry, when I say monetary, I mean uh, a unitary, um, a unitary uh, uh, a, a sort of a, a unified analysis that just has, you know, one set of noughts and ones that make it up or something like that, that it all gets reduced into... Um, this model now you know that is the work of understanding but you and and i and i don't think that that general pro i mean bringing anything everything into a unified uh, uh way of thinking or understanding that's laudable but you can't do that when it's centered around the sociological entity you can't do you can't ground that in sociology that is going to lead to to problems but sorry also what i was going to say about science itself is that uh, how I'm relating that to Jordan Hall is let's say the commitment to rationality and so the commitment to rationality has this tendency to lead you off into abstraction and disembodied thinking that would have you create this this comprehensive uh, uh, system of, of analysis that uh, locates itself beyond uh, uh, the uh, the proper um, Uh, I'm just trying to think of a, a good enough word that that works as an analogy. Um, uh, you know, I, I mean, when you're talking about things that have to, at the end of the day, relate to consciousness, it is problematic because, you know, if you get stuck into, let's say, uh, um, a deterministic reduction, you're going to have problems, which is why so much spiritual information has generally be, been encoded into what appears to be mysteries, and, w and which have to sort of be unlocked by a development of quite a sophisticated understanding. <clears throat> 
and spiritual knowledge um, that has, you know, a, a, a lot of depth in it. Um, yeah, I mean, I can give some, some sort of vague examples, but uh, I don't mean to, to try and... Uh, I'm not leaning on some, some sort of uh, uh, authority of Scripture, but just as, as to, to use an example to my point, uh, you know, there, you can literally read the Bible, and what I mean by that is you can literally try to take claims from it and then see that those claims contradict themselves. But it's not about factual claims. It's not making factual claims. It is uh, imparting an understanding. And part of that means you have to put some thought into integrating it. I saw Gad Sad recently talk about the, um, what do you call it, intellectual gymnastics. And like, yes, you, you do have to do intellectual gymnastics. That's exactly what it calls for, especially right from the beginning, from Genesis. Uh, there is light before there is a, a sun. So how do you square that circle? There is the earth which is created void and without form. What does that even mean then? So uh, the earth is an entity beyond... Uh, uh, the, the, the category of earth... Uh, exists in an unfurnished uh, state uh the 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 concept at least or at least uh if you're going to follow the line of reasoning in the scripture and you're going to make it internally consistent you have to do quite a lot of work to make it internally consistent and i was okay I'm not, let me then just uh, the example that i was going to use is just how god is spoken about uh in different places differently um in that uh you know, God is, is spoken of, of never being understandable, never seeing the face of God. And then it says that some people see the face of God. And in Revelations, it says, and the mystery of God shall be finished. And in Psalms, uh, it talks about uh, essentially the mystery of God being inexhaustible. You know, so it, it's... Um, uh, th th there are gaps that have to be filled in and there are secrets which are even spoken about explicitly um, not the content of the secrets but the the alluding to to the uh, the substance of, of what those secrets are um, you know the gospel is is something that that uh, Yeah, the, the distinction between gospel and doctrine um, is essentially the the particular conveyance, um, and because that conveyance has to introduce mystery and has to, um, it's effectively what a mystery is is just a low resolution of the entire story because you're never going to end up with an understanding if you don't have a way to handle it before you understand it. So you have to be able to handle the subject matter before you actually have a, a, a born out understanding because there are so many topics that are interrelated and that depend on each other and you can't learn them all simultaneously. You, you, you cannot, um, people don't have uh, almost the attention span and the patience and the intellectual uh, uh, broadness in order to uh, uh, hold multiple fragments in their head without some kind of introductory, um, at least broad outline in which that uh, you start furnishing the detail thereof. And so, you know, you have to start backwards. You have to start at the end. And that's why it has to be presented firstly as a mystery. But then the mystery shall be finished. That's the point. It has to become an understanding, as it talks about in First John chapter 5. Um, which is, I think, quite... Op it, uh, my understanding of a doctrine is that it's it's essentially a, a Christ consciousness that uh, 
Jesus Christ is not a person. It is a a condition of the mind. The only begotten Son is the name of the true mind. Um, Anyway, uh, this is tangential, but uh, I was just going to focus on the concept of of God itself, which uh, you know is is itself a, a complicated subject because of uh, let's say just say for now the Trinity, um, but the uh, which I mean I would you know I think it's very important to to root these things in psychology and uh, I'm not going to do that in this recording because that it's far too tangential but. Um, the idea that you're going to kind of take the rusty knife of rationality and you're going to just kind of uh, avoid all the nuances that that need to be, you know, essentially to use uh, a modern metaphor, is that you're not going to be a healer as a surgeon if you don't have a very sophisticated and nuanced understanding of all the intricacies involved. And you're going to take the rusty knife of rationality and you know, and with with some faulty logical axioms of transitivity, and you're just going to think that you're going to create this abstract palace that is going to you know somewhat um, not sink into the sand. Um, And, you know, we we keep on seeing more and more defects uh, in people's thinking that uh, they they haven't used more. Um, But, you know, that is the thing. At some point you have to actually, uh, in some sense, in a spiritual sense, there is no excuse for not seeking the kingdom, you know, which is, in fact, you know, something that that has to never end as well but you know i mean there are so i mean the scripture says uh you know i mean you have to be meek you have to actually be willing to take on that sort of uh uh, that intellectual humility which you know a lot of people they're they've got these almost these fake humility tests which, uh, uh, you know, that's too blunt, that's too curt, that's not, uh, that doesn't hit me in the right spots, that's not, that, that doesn't ring positive for me, you know, it, it doesn't uh, lift me up in all the ways that I expect to be lifted up, you know, they, have, they, they are rich with expectation and, and a kind of, uh, uh, they, they don't realize it yet, but they have a uh, uh, they have multiple senses uh, of of what should be, and stuck in the myriad of of that kind of prismatic uh, uh, rainbow vision. Uh, you know, effectively, the only thing that's going to bring them to anything that they would consider spiritual is going to be some kind of intoxication, or or um, chemically induced experience. And still, the mind goes unconditioned. Uh, the mind goes. Uh, uh, the mind ends up labeling something an understanding, and it's not an understanding. Uh, okay, that's that's just talking, I guess, in in general a bit. But um, there are. Let me think what else I can say on this topic that's somewhat relevant. But uh, there has to be a kind of commitment to going through hell in some sense. And or uh, and I use that metaphorically and perhaps this doesn't work that well with what I'm saying. But it's more like... Uh, Uh, what's a good way to liken it? Is uh, it says very clearly in the scripture when Jesus is is talking about disciples, he says, 
you have to hate uh, your own mother and father and brother and sister and your own life. You have to hate your own life to be worthy to be a disciple of mine. And that is a very intellectual form of hate that is being cited there. That if you if you're not willing to dispense and sacrifice and give up things, if you if you if you have affection uh, yeah, you, the only kind of affection that you can really have is is a, is a kind of stoic affection. Uh, you know, this has now been integrated probably well into something like a stoic philosophy. But uh, you know, the if if you're going to have this operating system that you're running off of intellectually that tells you that you love your mother and your father or your family or something like that, you are going to be so blind to overlooking uh, your alignment with uh, essentially what is just inherited uh, uh, conditioning and inclination towards a kind of environmental um, camouflage where you, you, you cannot see where... Uh, you begin and when some kind of uh, uh, and where the environment ends you know you, your sense of self becomes fuzzy uh, yeah this this probably doesn't work too well talking about this so obscurely uh, it's better to talk about the subject directly in in its own right but um you know, uh, I'll just say that you know the things that are said in Genesis are are, are worth being decoded and going into and exploring. Um, something like what Jordan Peterson did, but I, I would say I have uh, a different take on on a few things and certain details that go into more um, doctrinal uh, interpretation. Uh, to use a modern word, uh, rather my understanding of the doctrine. Um, I say interpretation only to acknowledge that I am in disagreement with what 99.9% uh, .9 of self-identifying Christians align themselves with. Um, Anyway, the uh, yeah, it's, it's always important to divorce language or the use of words from grammar itself, from the meaning. Um, in the the truth is not uh, in the words of the Bible. The truth is in the understanding of what the words mean. And so it becomes very important not to have a word-by-word -word translation of some kind of literal equivalence, but to have a direct translation, especially when you're dealing with languages like Greek, for instance, but um, uh, which, which was really quite... Uh, special language because of its almost its philosophical treatment of time. Uh, uh, you know, never were there better philosophers that understood, uh, uh, or at least were capable of accessing um, the minutia of of uh, the complexities of uh, um, a kind of metaphysical science. Uh, a bit tangential but um, oh, what I was going to say about uh, Genesis when it, it talks about um, I'll be as gods 
uh, knowing good and evil is it as gods uh, the, the grammar I think is, is uh, and they will die in the day or you will die in the day so it doesn't say that they will die uh, um, on the day they say that they will die in the day uh, you know, th th there are these these little things that uh, I'm sure Gad Sad would call intellectual gymnastics, or, uh, Olympian intellectual feats that have to be done to to square the circle, and it's and that really is where the juice of the doctrine is. I mean, uh, you know, they are minutiae that are overlooked everywhere because I mean, people they almost they are addicted to the literal side of of these things that they are and they they don't care really too much about the spiritual significance as long as they have their magic as it were you know that jesus christ must be born of a virgin even when in more than one of the disciples accounts of jesus's lineage it it includes joseph when when it gives the lineage of uh, um from king david to jesus uh it goes down through Mary and it goes down through Joseph. Uh, both genealogies are given. Uh, you know, the, the idea that he was... Uh, you know, uh, There has to be this kind of material uh, that no, it, it, it's sadly it's more of a belief in magic and having a sky father than really wanting to. Uh, to discover uh, the character of God and the nature of spiritual life. Um, and the teaching is essentially completely overlooked into what is essentially a kind of... Uh, uh, well, I mean, it's exactly what is described in Revelations when it talks about the beast, is that what what is a beast? A beast is conditioned by its environment. A beast has no free will. Uh, a beast is imprinted on by sort of fear and its own uh, fleshly desire, and that's what moves it forward. I mean, also the snake is another example of this, is that the snake crawls on its, on its hunger, on its belly, and it, all it tastes is dust, and it's camouflaged in its environment. And if you step on it, uh, it's because you didn't know, you weren't, you didn't have a good enough knowledge of of reading the environment and focusing on the environment, and understanding the environment, um, and seeing through the camouflage. You, you should have out knowledgeed the snake in some sense, and so you end up having to follow the way of the snake, and you have to crawl on your expectation and your hunger and and the the snake really is the symbol of the spirit of man which uh, as opposed to the spirit of god and the spirit of man being that um uh that your future self is god and so as gods do you you are thus uh, commanded by your knowledge of good and evil and so you taste dust and you crawl on your belly and you and you am amass these imaginary riches which belong to your future self uh, which forces you into the form of a snake unable to taste the fruit of of the living god and uh to be in any sort of of present um realization or self-realization 
which has to have some hope in the future self, let's just say, some trust of the future self, um, but not not knowledge of it. If you think you have knowledge of your future self, then you are automatically uh, a slave to that concept, and it will rule you by its, its uh, uh, dichotomy of knowledge of good and evil, uh, which effectively all your beliefs and notions will be reduced to. And, and this is the, the primary kind of, of um, you can call it a matrix, uh, uh, that, that uh, supports all the structures of the false ego, which I have not gotten into the complexities thereof, but, but there are, it, it gets quite convoluted because what I'm talking about is something that you are aware of at the early part of your life when you are seeding and developing this false ego um, but that it uh, that part of your life and those decisions and how you calibrated it uh, very quickly get forgotten as it were as the uh, false ego even has to sort of envelop itself uh, even twice that there are almost three competing um it's spoken about in the um, uh, in Revelations when it talks about the beast with seven heads, and then at some point it's the beast of three heads, but and, and ten crowns. Uh, there's a lot of overlap happening there, and uh, I'm not going to get into it because it's I'm stop this recording already. It's veered so horribly off course, but. Um, I just basically wanted to say that uh, introverted thinking and rationality itself is um, is what I was vaguely uh, uh, suggesting um, is what creates disembodied uh, analyses and solutions, and although they can certainly be used as useful pieces of the puzzle as it were like but you have to know that you're looking at something that is um you have to know how it is reductively defective so that you can kind of you know so it's almost like a, it's a very uh extravagant specialized perspective that is disembodied and if you put all those caveats on it then you can kind of maybe you you can kind of reap some of, of its uh, insight, but then you have to kind of re-package uh, it in a way that you can actually um, deal with it properly without being infected by its um, uh, untenable um, or an even unnatural intellectual uh, um, Uh, I almost want to say premises because you know it doesn't it doesn't I mean you could say one of the starting problems is that it almost doesn't elucidate on its own uh, premises moving forward from the start you know or at least uh, it, I mean I'm sure Jordan Hall has somewhere set out okay well these are the axioms that I'm moving from and I would just probably say if he has done that you'll probably find that there's something missing there in that it does not situate reality properly, that it kind of, it already starts by positing a kind of collective group conveyance through history. You know, it, it, it basically, it tracks abstract um, entities, uh, which you might say, well, is they are reductively representative of individual humans, but they don't. It doesn't quite translate f from that. Uh, you can call it uh, that level of discourse and that narrative uh, of those uh, um, instrumental uh, or uh, that pantheon of of uh, elements th that you're thinking about or contemplating. 
this is probably easier ways of saying all of this. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I must say, I'm always, when, when I, sometimes I'm perhaps talking far too intuitively and I don't get the wording quite right. And when I'm listening to my own recordings, I think, oh, you know, obviously that's what I was getting at. But I know that there's a huge portion of anyone that might listen to me that will will not be able to kind of draw those connections, that they won't be able to kind of bridge any gap. And if you don't kind of utterly and, and you know, kind of... Uh, uh, really take it down to a kind of a rational if then so you know kind of syllogism uh they just kind of technically dance out of it and they say well that obviously has no application because you know there there is one word that would be missing to actually make it ironclad you know and they can only even respond or think about something that appears as a kind of ironclad construction against their ironclad self-made mind prison you know and i guess uh if you think that i'm running foul of of the iron sharpening iron well that works on the level of swords actually which is the symbol of the tongue uh of 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 speech and thought and the intellect the tongue is the representation and the expression of the condition of the mind and the understanding um, and when it is is a, a kind of a mind forged manacle that uh, you know people are somewhat reluctant to shed those unless you replace them with another one that will do the same sort of work uh, sadly.